Boy, I have to keep reminding myself sometimes when we read through the book of Psalms and we look at Psalms that this is actually a songbook. And we just read this passage. Did it sound like a song to you? Probably not because most of the songs you hear in general, they're, they're, obviously there's different styles and stuff, but this is not what you're used to hearing. I mean, how much doctrine is packed into these Psalms? It's amazing. We're going to be going through this, you know, as short as this psalm is. Last week we only had five verses, yet I preached a full-length sermon on five verses because that's how much content, and I probably could have kept going and going. And that's the way God's Word is, and how awesome is that? But let's jump into this before I waste too much of my breath. Let's look at God's Word here. Verse number 1, the Bible says, Preserve me, O God, for in Thee do I put my trust. And what a great verse, just, just right off the bat. I put my trust, you know, that's what we need for salvation. We need to put our trust. That's a, another word for, you know, believe or put your faith in your trust. That's right. We're trusting in Jesus Christ. Amen. We're not trusting in how good we are. We're trusting in what he did for us. Uh, I mean, think about the level of trust. You trust your spouse, right? You trust your spouse. You go away from her and that she's going to be faithful to you. You're going to be faithful to her. And there's a lot of trust there. And that level of trust is nothing like the trust that we have in Christ because we know that God is faithful you know, Man's a sinner. People do wicked things sometimes. But we know that the Lord is true and that God never backs out. He never breaks His promise. He is faithful and true when nobody else is. And that's why we can trust the Lord. But I also, when I was reading this and kind of preparing for the sermon, I noticed it says, you know, it says, in thee do I put my trust. And it is the, the words that popped into my head is the words that... This country used to actually believe in general, at least what was promoted as being something that, that the people of this country believed in hundreds of years ago. In God we trust, right? Amen. Still printed on our money. Yeah. In God we trust. Boy, what a great model. What a great fa- pra- phrase. Unfortunately, it doesn't mean anything to people today. Amen. That's why they're trying to get rid of it. But, you know, blessed is that, is that nation whose God is the Lord. Amen. And blessed are the people that, that worship the Lord and serve the Lord. And we see here, we'll get later on in this passage, how he's saying, you know, I I am going to look up to or communicate with the people that love God. And I'm briefly summarizing, we'll get into it. And I'm not even going to talk about those who go after, you know, false gods and everything else. It's not even going to come across my lips and I have nothing to do with them. But would to God we could get back to an area where we could say, where, where in God we trust actually meant something. That's right. And you know, the only way, the only way that's ever, you know, it's not going to happen with the politicians. That's right. It's not going to happen with Donald Trump. Yeah, right. No matter how many people are like, oh, God blessed us and gave us this great savior in Donald Trump. Yeah, right. right. He's just like the rest of them, you Amen. fool. Amen. Right. You've been deceived. Amen. Which war is he trying to get us into now? Syria? Korea? What, what, where, are we, where are we going to fight? Everywhere. You want, everywhere. What's changed? Nothing. Oh, you, I'm going to get a little bit more money back from the IRS. Big stinking whip, right? A little, a little bit of money that's going to perish with you anyway. So what? What was that about about abortion? And oh, well, I'm, I'm anti-abortion stuff. Oh wait, yeah. And then he goes and funds Planned Parenthood. Yeah, right. The guy's a stinking joke. That's right. Don't be deceived by the politicians. The politicians aren't going to save the country. They never have. They never will. You know who's going to do. If anything's going to be done in this country, it's going to be people who love God going out and preaching the gospel, preaching the truth, getting through to the hearts and the minds of the people of this country. And hey, the choice is going to be on them, but we need to be going out and doing it. If you're going to make any impact at all, it's going to start with the individual. That's right. It has to start with the individual. We have to get our morality back by preaching this, not by electing politicians. In God we trust. That's that's the motto here. We do trust in the Lord here. That's what David was saying here. In thee do I put my trust. And you know what? God will preserve you. He made that promise to the children of Israel back when he was giving them the law. He says, hey, follow my laws. Just obey me. Put your trust in me. Don't go and serve other gods. Don't go and get yourself off in all this other mess that the nations that were here before you did. And they got wiped out. You saw firsthand because I used you to get rid of them. Don't be like them. Trust me. 
And he says, I'll bless you. Remember, he says, I have before you a blessing and a curse. To choose life, therefore. Follow the ways of the Lord. Put your trust in God and He will preserve. He'll preserve the nation and He'll definitely preserve your soul. Verse number 2. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, thou art my Lord. My goodness extendeth not to thee. Uh, this verse, now obviously, verse 1, if you're going to say anything about salvation, verse 1 would be salvation. I'm putting my trust in you. Right. I trust you. But you know what comes after salvation is what we ought to do. Yes. We ought to live a right life. We ought to repent of our sins. We ought to do good works. We ought to make Jesus the Lord of our life. Now, we don't do those things in order to be saved. We do those things after we're saved to be right with God. He says here, oh, my soul, thou was said of the Lord. Look what he says. His soul. So this is, this is genuine. This is inside of it. My soul is talking to the Lord. He's saying, thou art my Lord. Now, he's not saying thou art my, um, you know, like the Lord in all caps, like God's name. Yeah. He's saying, you are my boss. Amen. You are God. You are my Lord. And I'm going to listen to you as such and submit myself unto you as such. That's what, come, that's what should be coming after salvation, where, where you are making Jesus the Lord of your life. I hate that for you even using that phrase because so many false prophets are saying you need to do that to be saved, but it's a huge difference. Yeah. We need to put our, our faith and in, in our trust in the Lord to be saved and then recognize Him, hey, you're my Lord. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to do what you have for me to do. He says, my goodness extendeth not to thee. Like the goodness of God is so much greater. He says, my goodness... It doesn't extend to you. It doesn't get, you know, I don't have that much goodness that God has. He says, but my goodness, you know, my goodness can extend to the saints that are in the earth. So he's saying, my goodness, my love, my, my comfort, and, you know, I'm going to help out and, and I'm going to try to be good to them. He's like, I can't be good to you, God, because you're good. You're, <laughs> you have so much more good than I do. You know, it doesn't extend to you. But I'm going to be good to, to other saints, to other believers, to other brethren in Christ. My, my love is going to extend to them. My goodness is going to extend to them. By, uh, but to the saints that are in the earth, he says, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. When you get saved, you have a new spirit inside of you. Amen. But you still have the flesh. Amen. And, and here is the conflict and here is the struggle and here is the battle that we have. Now, in the spirit, you're going to want to go to church. You're going to want to see your brothers. You want to encourage each other. You want to be a blessing to them. But you know what your flesh is going to want to do? Your flesh is going to want to stay home. Your flesh is going to want to say, yeah, who cares about that? Or who cares about them? Or, or just, I'm only going to care about myself. I'm kind of tired today. I want to sit back. I want to, I want to go home. I don't, want to, I don't want to go to church. I want to watch TV. That's what your flesh wants to do. But in your spirit, you're going to say, no, I'm going to, I'm going to give my goodness to them. They're my delight. See, shortly after being saved, I know for myself personally, and maybe other people can attest to the same thing. You, you, of course, you have the spirit that wants to do good. I want to tell people how to be saved. But I wasn't always that thrilled about going to church. It wasn't always something that, that was what I wanted to do. Because I was walking in the flesh. I was still used to being in my flesh. And my flesh would be like, yeah, no, why don't you go out bowling and say, why don't you go play some pool? Why don't you go out to the bar? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do anything else? Church is kind of boring. Now, of course, when I got saved, I wasn't plugged into a really good church. Anyway, I had a hard time finding a good church. If I would have got plugged in, I probably would have been a little bit more enjoyable anyways. When you're actually being fed, you're actually hearing someone preach the Word of God and give you good doctrine. And they're not ashamed of the Word of God, but they're willing to preach the whole counsel of God. Right. Then maybe I would have stuck, you know, stuck around a little bit more and it would have been more interesting. But nonetheless... Even if you don't have the ideal church or the best preacher in the world, but they're saved and they're serving the Lord and they're doing good, you got to get yourself in there Amen. And, and learn to walk in the Spirit and to put away the lust of the flesh so that you can go and be a blessing to other people. Because I'll tell you what, even as a, as a spiritual baby, you're, you're still often concerned about yourself. Amen. Yeah. As you grow spiritually... You know, if Christ is our model, if Christ is the goal, of, I mean, which he is, right? The model of perfection. Do you know the mind of Christ was not on himself at all? That's right. He didn't come to be ministered unto, but to minister. As we grow spiritually, and keep this in mind, and remember this, it's not about you. When you go to church, it's not what can the church do for me? What programs are there for my kids at church? What is there for me to do in church? Oh, you know, what are you going to do for me? Who's going to help me out? 
If you think like that, you're still an infant spiritually. That's right. And you know what? If you're a spiritual infant, I mean, you have to start somewhere. But you need to learn to grow to have your goodness upon the saints, upon the excellent, upon the people who love the Lord. And surround yourself more with that. Start to love going to church. And the only way you're going to love going to church is being in the Spirit. Because your flesh isn't going to love church. Your flesh is going to be hearing things that it doesn't want to hear in church. We need to get the mindset of thinking on the others. He says, verse number 3, But to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent, whom is all my delight, their sorrows shall be multiplied. Now he's, now he's going to switch gears. He's talking about a different group of people. He said, to the saints, that's my goodness. That's what I love. That's who I'm going to be around. They're my delight. I take pleasure in being around the saints and other people and helping them out. Verse number 4, Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. To the people in the false religions or their... Caught up serving some other God. He says they're going to have sorrow. Their sorrows are going to be multiplied. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer. He says, I'm not going to partake in that. I'm not going to go join myself unto them, nor take up their names into my lips. See, I'm not even going to mention the names of their gods. I'm not even going to talk about it. I have nothing to do with it. So you see the two extremes. I'm going to you know, indulge myself or surround myself with the saints, and that's going to be my delight. That's going to be my joy. And I'm not even going to speak of the false gods and, and, and you know, their sacrifices, what they're doing over there. We have nothing to do with that. Verse number 5, The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. So he's talking about his inheritance, right? As someone who trusts in the Lord, we have a portion, we have an inheritance with God. God gives us something that we're going to receive later. We know we have mansions in heaven, the Bible talks about. There is an inheritance, there's a home already prepared for us. And the reason why we get an inheritance is because we're a child of God through Jesus Christ. Amen. When you're born again, you become his child. And, I mean, who inherits anything? It's a, it goes through families. That's right. When, when parents die, they leave an inheritance. They leave their goods or their, you know, whatever they have to their children. It passes down through the family. You being born again, becoming a child of God, has put you in God's family. Amen. Which means he's got an excellent inheritance Amen. for you. Way better than anything you could inherit on this earth. Amen. Because this earth is going to be burned up anyways. But he's got an inheritance for you that never, that never fails and never ends in the heavens. He says, the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot, or you know, my stuff. God maintains it. He keeps it for you. It's going to keep going. Verse 6, the lines are falling unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. Again, a heritage is like an inheritance from the same root word. He's just talking about it's a, it's a good thing I have set up for me. Verse 7, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. God, you know, praise God. I'll bless the Lord for giving me counsel, for giving me instruction, for telling us what we need to do, giving us good advice, how we are supposed to make decisions in this life. What are we supposed to do? God gives us the light in his word to do that. And especially in the book of Psalms, in the book of Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, he gives us a lot of wisdom. I mean, the whole Bible, the whole Bible is full of it, right? You go to law, you go all over the place, you're going to find this light and this blessing from the Lord who's giving us counsel. Verse number 8, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Now, um, I know some of you weren't here last week, but if you recall last week's sermon, we were in Psalm 15. And the first verses in Psalm 15 is, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? So it's talking about who's going to remain, God? How am I going to last and abide in church, in your tabernacle? How am I going to be able to, to, to maintain and sustain my Christianity and, and my growth? Because when you go to church for any length of time, you see it happen. You see people come and go. And it's sad, you know, you don't like to people see people go, but it, it's reality. It happens. In a good church, in a fire-breathing church, people who are really excited about serving God, there will be people that come, that get on fire, that are serving the Lord. They're good people, they're saved, but they end up getting out of church. And you need to make sure that that doesn't happen to you. 
Right. And I'm not going to re-preach last week's sermon, but Psalm 15 is all about that. It explains how you can know and you can just make sure you're established. And then in Psalm 16, we have this one verse here. He says, I have set the Lord always before me. So when you have just set God before your face, just right in front of you, that is one way to make sure that I'm never going to be moved. Amen. He says, I've got God in my right hand. You know, like he's my right hand man. He's right here to help me. We saw last week, we turned a lot of passages where Satan is at people's right hand to oppose them. That's right. We need to make sure we have God at our right hand to help us, to give us the counsel, to give us the advice, and that we're focused on Him. It's funny how we can have the Lord always before me and at our right hand, right? Because we need to be focused on looking to Him, and He'll be there for us. Yes, when we are focused on serving Him and have Him always before us, He'll be at our right hand to help you out. And, and again, the words of the Lord, we can take that to the bank. I mean, it's, it's no truer word spoken. Amen. It's true. The Lord needs to be your focus, so He needs to be your right hand, not Satan, and then you won't be moved. Like, that's a promise. He says, I shall not be moved. But you have to do something. You have to keep the Lord the focus. As soon as you get distracted, to the left or to the right, now you're getting in shaky territory. Now you're getting into movable territory. We need to stay with Him. And obviously, you guys know this, we're not talking about salvation, we're just talking about our walk with God. Amen. Staying in church, staying, doing what we're supposed to be doing, keeping the Lord in front of our face, and being surrounding ourselves with the right people, as he was talking about earlier. You know, not, not these people, you know, off in, in false religion, everything else. It matters who your friends are. Choose your friends wisely because they will have an influence on you. That's good. They will. We need to be very careful about that. And I'm not going to get into any details because it doesn't. It, it's not appropriate at this time. But just take my word for it. There have been people that I've witnessed. There have been people that maybe you've witnessed too. That get into a good church. That love God. And had made the wrong friends. Right. And when confronted with wickedness or sin, because you know, sometimes you don't always know. You make friends with people and everything looks good on the outside, right? I mean, hey, they're in church. They're in a good church too. They appear to love God. You know, you come in, you make friends with them. But then what happens? Sometimes people start talking about really wicked things. When you go outside of church, you go hang out and you just make friends with people. But watch out for that. Yeah. Amen. You, because you, here's the thing. You are responsible for yourself. You're not responsible for anybody else as far as you know, their walk with God. Maybe if you're married or your husband, you're responsible for your family too. That's right. You're responsible for your wife and children. That's it. Amen. You're not responsible for, for your friends and other people. Now, we should try to be a blessing. But you know what? One of the ways that you can help people out is when people start getting into wickedness or backbiting or anything like that is you tell them the truth. That's right. You say, I'm going to remain firm. I'm not going to allow that leaven to infect me and leaven just all of us here because I'd rather be friends with them and not say something that might offend them right. or might hurt them. People elevate, unfortunately, people get emotional, especially women, they get emotional, and they allow this emotion to become just, just too much. And when they know something is right, they choose, well, I don't want to lose my friend because I really like them. As opposed to saying, no, you're actually being very wicked and I'm not going to go down with you. That's right. But people get, you know, as some people are on their way out, they try to drag other people with them. You need to make sure that the Lord is your priority. I mean, He's your Savior. You owe Him, you owe him your whole soul. Amen. You owe Him everything. That's right. So why in the world would you elevate someone else, a relationship with somebody else, over your relationship with the Lord? Amen. And we need to be care- We need to take heed to ourselves. Take heed lest you fall. Amen. We are all susceptible to sin. Everybody, myself included, everybody. It's very true. We look at all the great men of God. Everybody's susceptible to sin. Everybody is. Don't ever think that you are above that, or that you know when people start, your friends start coming and, and talking wickedness to you, that oh well, I'm going to be able to help them out because I'm stronger. The way you're going to help them, and I'm talking about extreme, you know, I'm not talking about just, you know, my, just mild, sinful things that, you know, we're all sinners. I'm talking about some serious stuff. You know, 1 Corinthians 5 talks about things people need to be, you know, not even eating with. 
and just shunned because that is extremely wicked. You go through that list later on, look through all those sins. You got friends that are involved in stuff like that. It's time to, to have some tough love with that person That's right. and just say, nope, as long as you're doing this, I'm going to have nothing to do with you. I hope you change. I hope you get right with God. Until then, you have nothing to do with me. Amen. That's right. And sometimes people need to hear that. And you know, you end up enabling people and making things worse when you refuse to cut those ties. So those ties. Because even if some other people cut those ties, if they still have that, that support from, from someone else that's just going to allow them to just keep going and keep going and keep going, you're not helping them at all. Amen. It's, that's actually very unloving. Continue that because sometimes people just need to, you know, in, in one sense or another, hit bottom before they get right with God. We had a friend growing up, you know, before I was even saved, I had a friend that was uh, getting into crack and stuff. He started with cocaine and crack. And it's like, he was our friend. We liked this guy. He was someone I was friends with as a child. I've known him since I was about seven or eight years old. Okay? And in high school, we started getting into all this stuff. And, you know, I wasn't perfect either, but I mean, this is, he's starting to get really bad. And, you know, we're, we're friends with him. And, you know, all of us were just trying, we see him just going down this, this path. And we're like, look, man, you know, you can't do that. And then after a while, it got to the point where he's just borrowing money and stealing. So it's just like, we're not going to be friends with you anymore. You got to change, man. You know, it's, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, you know. And then this never happened. Well, that's a very worldly example of the right thing to do. Yeah. Because we, we did. We had to just cut communication with them until, you know, and just realize, you know, hopefully something would get through like, wow, I'm losing my family. I'm losing my friends for this drug. And unfortunately, drug pulls are, can be very much more powerful even than that. And, they, you know, people choose the drug. But it's, it's better to force the issue to get to that point to be like, look, do you, I mean, do you care about us or not? Yeah. Do you care about the Lord or not? Because I'll tell you what, my friends, if you don't care about the Lord, then I don't want to be around you. That's right. Because I don't want you starting to get me off on some to the left side or the right side getting distracted into something of the world. Because you don't care about the Lord and trying to entice me into something else. I don't want that. I want to keep the Lord in front of my face. I want the Lord in my right hand. And I want that for you too, but I'm not going to let that come and, and, and move me. It doesn't mean that my friends have to be perfect. That's right. You can have a new believer as a friend that has all kinds of sin in their life, but if they've got, if they care about the Lord and they've got the Lord for them and they're willing to just try to keep moving forward, then great, be my friend. You could be a spiritual infant and be my friend, but who I don't want to be friends with is the people who got their back to God. They might not even realize it. I don't want to go back. I don't want to slide back there with them. They turn around and start moving forward. Great. I help you out. And we help each other out. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 9. This is actually where we're going to spend probably the most time this evening. Verse number 9 reads, Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth, and my flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now, Thank God for the New Testament. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. Keep your place here in Psalm 16. We're coming back to it. But we have been, we have such an opportunity. We have been given so much just by being born in the times that we live in. Because God has continual, continued to reveal more and more of His Word and reveal more and more understanding throughout time. Now, <laughs> when, Psalm, when the Psalms were written down, there's so much truth here. There's so much packed into here. But what we start to see is some of these things that you still might not have a lot of clarity on, right? It's like you can see it, but you're still not certain what exactly does this mean. And then you get the New Testament where God has just really opened up the understanding of His apostles and just given them this, this knowledge to, to be able to, to transmit through His Word and the revealing of His Word in the New Testament to just fully explain without a shadow of a doubt. Now, this doctrine, 
I, it boggles my mind that any believer ever can have a problem with the clear teaching on this issue. Because what we're reading about in the book of Psalms, and you read through all the book of Psalms, there's so much prophecy, there's so much prophetic language being used. And you see Psalms that, that are clearly referring to Jesus Christ. Clearly referring about the things he's going to go through. Clearly referring to him being crucified, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Now, it's clear to us because we know the whole story. Yes. Right? It wasn't quite as clear in the Old Testament. The, the disciples didn't even understand the resurrection fully. Just because they didn't, they didn't have all of that information. They had, the God, they had the Word of God, but they didn't quite get it all. We understand this stuff. So when you compare, so you know, if we just had Psalm 16, well, you can see that the say the Holy One seems pretty obvious. It's talking about the Savior. It's talking about the Messiah, right? That's how we know it's prophetic in verse number ten. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. The yeah, Holy One, he's sanctified, he's set apart, he's holy. Jesus Christ is holy. We're not holy. The only reason we have any holiness is through Him. Amen. But He's the Holy One. He's the just one. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. What's that saying? If it says, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, if a soul is not left in hell, I got news for you. It had to be in hell to not be left there. That's right. If I'm with my family somewhere and I get dropped off, I get dropped off in Phoenix, I say, hey, don't leave me in Phoenix, right? They're going off with a car. Don't leave me here. Yeah. It means I'm there, right? I say, hey, come back and pick me up and get me out of here, you know, because it's so hot in Phoenix right now. I want to go back up to Prescott Valley. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But um, I, obviously he's in hell. That's right, yeah. Now, the, the weird doctrines that are out there, and you're in Acts 2, right? Just stay in Acts 2. We're going to get to that in a minute. The weird doctrines that are out there say that, oh, yeah, it says hell, but, you know, there's actually two different parts of hell. And, you know, there's one place that's actually called paradise. It's not really the burning, torturous, tormenting part. It's actually just a, a okay place. You know, it's kind of dark because it's in the middle of the earth. But they must have had the light of hell, the light of, you know, so I, I don't know. I don't know what they think about that place because it's ridiculous. That's right. There's no part about the center of the earth that sounds like a very good place to me. Right. Even science will tell you what the, the, the core of the earth consists of, what hell consists of, and it's not a place I even want to be around. That's right. Okay? But it says in verse 9 in, in Psalm 6, verse 3, he says, My heart is glad, my glory rejoices, my flesh also shall rest in hope. He's being hopeful. He's saying, I've got something to look forward to. It's actually going to be a good thing. Why? Because you won't leave my soul in hell. So what is the good He's hoping that his soul will not be left in hell. If it's such a paradise, it's such a great place, why would he even care? He'd be like, well, I can just stay in here forever. Who cares? It's a great place. Right. It's a great place to be. We'll hang out with the Old Testament saints. <laughs> but it's not a good place. He's saying, I'm hoping my flesh will rest in hope. Because you won't leave my soul in hell. It's easy to preach that from Psalm 16. The reason why now is because we have Acts chapter 2. We have Peter who explains exactly. I mean, just, just like you hear, you go to church, you hear a preacher, we read the Bible, and then a preacher expounds on the message. It kind of gives the understanding and the meaning of the verses. Just clearly what they're saying. Peter's already done this in Acts chapter 2. So we have the benefit of hearing a preacher that has the Word of God and is, and is definitely speaking under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, yeah. explaining what this verse means. And that this is actually referring to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 22 in Acts 2. It's where we're going to start reading in context here. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. 
He's preaching to Israel, saying, you know that Jesus was good. You know he was approved of God. You've seen his miracles. You saw the work that he was doing. Yet you still wickedly took him and killed him. But he already mentions this. It was already known by God. Yeah. God already had the foreknowledge of this. God knew it was going to happen. Verse number 24. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. What does he do? He says that God raised him from the dead. Speaking very clearly of the resurrection, saying, you killed him, but God raised him from the dead. He came back to life. This is the context. This is what we're talking about. Verse 25, for David speaketh concerning him. Concerning who? Jesus. That's what he's talking about. David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Does that sound familiar? Because it sounds like something we were just, I was just preaching about. That's right. Verse 8 in Psalm 16, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. So what's he quoting? Psalm 16. And now he's going to quote verse 9. Verse 9, Psalm 16 says, Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. Therefore, in verse X, 226, Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Next verse is lines up with verse 10. Psalm 16, verse 10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Acts 2, 27. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. He's quoting Psalm 16, word for word. Amen. And he's relating it to Jesus Christ. Verse 28. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Again, continuing to quote. Verse 30. No, I'm not going to keep going back and forth. Or verse 29, men and brethren. So now he's going to give the explanation. He just quoted Psalm 16, half of it. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. Why is he bringing up David? Because David's the one who wrote down this psalm. This is a psalm of David. So David's the one who wrote Psalm 16. Now he's going to explain. Let me tell you about David. Verse 29, that he is both dead and buried... And his sepulcher is with us unto this day. He's saying he hasn't ro- rose from the grave. Right. His body is still in that grave today. He died. He's buried. His body's still there. That's right. Therefore, knowing this, knowing that David's body is still in the grave, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, He would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He's seeing this before. So he already knows. He's saying David already knew because he received the promise of God that of his descendants, of his seed, in the future, Christ was going to come up through the house of David. And that is what happened. And he said, because he knew that it was going to happen, now he's speaking under inspiration of the Holy Ghost and he is prophesying of that seed of Jesus Christ. And and Peter's explaining all of this to them right now. He's giving the explanation of Psalm 16. He's seeing this before. Verse 31 spake of the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell neither his flesh did see corruption. How much more clear can you get? It's not talking about David's soul going to hell. It's not talking about David's body being resurrected from the dead. It's talking about Jesus Christ, the seed of David, unto whom David was promised that he would come, that the Christ would come. Jesus Christ, his soul was not left in hell. Why? Because his soul went to hell. That's right. Turn to Matthew 12. We're going to look through much of the evidence tonight because it's not even just... I mean, this one passage, I feel like this one passage is enough. This explanation of Psalm 16 cannot be any more clear to me. Abigail, sit down over there. It cannot be any more clear to me. Jesus' soul went to hell. Now, I challenge anybody to show me any portion of Scripture that says hell is actually a good place. Hell is paradise. No, the only thing they can do is, is try to use mental gymnastics and try to say, well, see, Jesus said today thou shalt be with me in paradise, so if he was in hell, then hell must be paradise. Stupidity. Yeah. Paradise is used three times in the Bible. It's never talking about a bad place. It's always talking about a good place. 
and we have reference of paradise being up. Mm-hmm. No reference of being down. Hell is never a positive reference, ever, not one time in the Bible. Not once. Always a bad place. That's why it's so important that the Bible says that Jesus' soul went to hell. It was in hell. And not only were they going, it wasn't left there. Because it was a bad place. Matthew 12, 39. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. This is Jesus speaking. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Again, another prophet. Jesus is saying, he's saying, you know what? Just like Jonah was swallowed up by that whale and he was in that whale's belly for three days and three nights. He's saying the Son of Man is going to spend three days and three nights in the heart of the heart is the center. It's not off to the side. It's not six feet under the surface. It's in the heart. It's in the center. That's where hell is. Let's turn to Jonah 2 now. Because he's referencing Jonah for a very good reason. Because just as David was a prophet, just as David was foreseeing and prophesying of future events, Jonah did the same exact things. Just as much as David's soul wasn't going to hell, just as much as David's body wasn't resurrected, Jonah's soul didn't go to hell, and Jonah's body wasn't resurrected. But let's see what Jonah prophesied in Jonah chapter 2. Because Jesus brought this up as a reference to him being in the heart of the earth. Well, let's see what Jonah said. Let's see what that prophet said. Jonah 2, verse number 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. So now this is when he's swallowed up. He's inside the belly of the fish. And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Look at this. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Was Jonah in hell? No, he was in the belly of the whale, not in the belly of hell. That's right. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hadst cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods come past me about. All thy billows and thy waves pass me over. So notice, there's this back and forth going here between his actual physical condition and his prophecy of Jesus Christ. He says, you know, I was in the belly of the fish. Out of the belly of hell, I cried. Now he's saying, you know, I was in the deep. I was in the sea. I've got, you know, the waves are kind of hitting me and stuff. The floods compass me about. Then I said, verse 4, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Again, physically, he's talking about, you know, the waters about me, and weed, you know, seaweed, all this other stuff around me. Look at verse number 6. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me. Forever, it means around me. Like I, I had the earth bars. Now, was that the case while Jonah was in the whale's belly? No. The whale might have dove down kind of deep, but he was not encompassed by the earth's bars around forever. He says, yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Verse 7, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. My prayer came into the, in unto thee, into thine holy temple. This is talking about God hearing his prayer, right? And, and what it is, is this dual purpose. He's in the belly of the whale, and he's crying to God, and God hears him, right? Because that's when he hum, Jonah humbles himself and then goes and preaches to Nineveh. He's put through all this affliction. But what he's prophesying is Jesus Christ going through the torture and the turmoil of hell. Because I'll tell you what, being in the whale's belly was not pleasant for Jonah to be in. That's right. No one's going to want to be in that environment. With, with, you know, he didn't die, but I guarantee it was not a pleasant place to be at all. Right. In darkness and bile and refuge and whatever, the, you know, those, the half-rotted stuff and everything else in there. Disgusting, horrible place to be for three days and three nights. Yeah, that got him to, to, to reconsider. And you know what? People who are burning in hell right now, I bet you they've already reconsidered their ways. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's nothing they can do about it. But when Jesus Christ's soul went to hell, he was encompassed about forever. He's in the heart of the earth. 
and he suffered in hell for our sins. Now look, it only makes sense. Turn, if you would, to uh, Exodus chapter 12. It's the last place we're going to turn to to prove this point. Exodus chapter 12. But just logically speaking, it makes perfect sense. What do we tell people about sowing all the time? Why do we deserve hell? Because we're sinners. Does the Bible say for the wages of sin is death? Now, did Jesus have any sin? No, of course not. But did Jesus come to pay for the sins of the whole world? Sure did. Did Did he bear the sins of the world in his own body on the tree? He absolutely did. So if he came to pay for our sins, make the payment for our sins, doesn't it just make sense that he went to hell to pay for our sins? That's right. Now, just because we believe that, does that mean, oh, well, I thought the blood washes us. Of course it does. Of course he needs to shed his blood. But it's not just the blood. It's not just the death. You have to have the death, the blood, the burial, the resurrection. You need all of it. That's right. It all needed to happen. And you know what one aspect of that? Was Jesus' soul going to hell? That's right. That had to happen too. It all has to happen. Amen. We're trusting in all of it. The whole thing. That's right. The whole gospel. Everything that Jesus did for us is what we're trusting in. One more illustration. And see, we thank God for Acts 2. Because people will look at Jonah 2, or they'll look at Psalm 16, or they'll look at Exodus 12, and they'll want to brush it aside because it's not quite as clear. Acts 2 makes there no doubt about it. Amen. At Exodus 12, what we're going to see, this is, this is the requirements for the Passover. The Passover lamb. Now, no one will dispute that Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb. That's clear. And when we look back now, when we look at all the requirements, when you see, well, wait, how were they supposed to observe the Passover? There are some very, very specific requirements on the Passover lamb. Different than every any other sacrifice that was made, the Passover was special. Now look, some of these you can apply to other sacrifices and things like that, but the Passover lamb had probably the most rules kind of applied to it of what they had to do, and it was very, very specific because it was so, so prophetic. It's a picture of Jesus to come. So God saying, no, this is the way you do it. So let's start reading in verse number 5 of Exodus 12. The Bible says, your lamb shall be without blemish. No imperfections, no, no marks. Jesus was perfect, so your lamb that you take to sacrifice, it needs to be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill in the evening. And again, I'm not going to go through expounding all of the, all the, everything that happened to Jesus actually as the, the lamb. The 14th day of the month, the whole congregation's killing it. Go study it out for yourself, but we're going to focus in on this one thing. It says, And they shall take of the blood, verse 7, and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat. We've got a picture of the cross there, verse number 8. And they shall eat the flesh in that night. Look at this. Roast with fire and unleavened bread. Unleavened, no sin, just completely pure. From any leaven and roast with fire, it says, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Verse number nine. Isn't it interesting that not only does it say roast with fire, it makes a point here to be very, very, very clear. You do not prepare this any other way. Because when you prepare food, there's lots of ways to prepare food. That's right. you can boil it, you can cook, you know, there's, there's, there's all kinds of ways. He's saying here, look at verse number nine. Eat not of it raw, it cannot be raw, it needs to be cooked nor sodden at all with water. You can't even start to prepare with water. You have no water at all. But roast with fire, his head, with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof, and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. Very clear. No, fire has to be a part of the sacrifice, and anything that you don't eat, that you don't consume, it all has to be burned. Completely consumed by the fire. Don't have any water with it. Don't have any leaven with it. Don't have a blemish in the lamb. It needs to be perfect, pure, no water, roast with fire. And you're going to tell me that hell is a good place? You're going to tell me that this is not symbolic? Everything else in this passage is symbolic in one way or another of Jesus Christ and what he did. Yet the roast with fire has nothing to do with it, right? That's just thrown in there. That whole extra verse about not water, not, you know, just make sure it's all burnt with fire. Doesn't mean anything. 
When the Lamb represents Jesus Christ. When Psalm 16 says his soul was in hell. When Acts chapter 2 says his soul was in hell. Speaking of the resurrection of Christ. People who refuse this doctrine are either proud or not saved. Because I don't see how you can look at all of this evidence in Scripture and not believe it. And not accept it. You have to have some other agenda going on to not want to accept this. That's right. And you do not have sincerity for the truth of God's word. You have something else propped up in your head that's making you not want to accept this. And you've got a stiff neck and a hard heart. Amen. This is a clear doctrine. Amen. This is what we believe here. This is what the Bible clearly teaches. Amen. It shouldn't even have to be preached this hard. Amen. Because it's so obvious. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, we live in a time where it does need to be preached that hard. But I'm going to make a stand for the word, the word of the Lord. Amen. Because I'm going to set the Lord before my face, and I want Him at my right hand. Amen. So we're going to preach the truth. Amen. Psalm 16, last verse, verse number 11. The Bible says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And this is, you know, this this goes hand in hand with what we were talking about. This 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 was part of the comfort that Jesus Christ had even in hell, was knowing that he wasn't going to be forsaken, knowing he wasn't just going to be left there, because in heaven, in God's presence, is the fullness of joy. Turn if you would to first, we're, we're done in Psalm 16. Turn if you would to First John chapter one. We have a little bit more um, information on this this one. Uh, This one point, just the full, the fullness of the joy of being in the presence of God and, and how we can have joy here on earth. You know, yes, focus on God, but how are we going to do that? It says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. We don't want to be in the path of death. Even if our soul is saved, we don't want to be going down that road. Because that's not going to be joyful. That is not going to be good for you to be on that path. We want to be on the path of life. You're in First John chapter number 1. He says, in thy presence is fullness of joy. We want your joy to be full. At that right hand, there are pleasures forevermore, for eternity. John, 1 John chapter 1 is actually a book that's written, and, and John tells us, he says, hey, I want your joy to be full. Let's read it. Verse number 1. We're start reading verse number 1. Read this whole chapter. It's real short. The Bible says, that which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Right to the path of life. Some of Jesus Christ, the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And that's about having fellowship together, right? Spending time together, having relationship together, having fellowship one with another. Hey, our fellowship is with God and the Father, with Jesus Christ. And we're right next to We have fellowship with you too. We have fellowship with the brethren. And that's why we're declaring this. We've seen and we've heard all this stuff from Jesus. And now we want you to have fellowship with us in the same truth and the path of life. Verse number four. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. We're giving you this information. We want your joy to be full. So how is your joy going to be full? (laughs) Let's keep reading. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So he's saying that because God is light, God's going to have the fullness of joy. We want you to be in that light. You need to first accept that and and put your trust in the light, in the life, in the way, in Jesus Christ. Then you can have fellowship with us and we can have fellowship with the Father. And he's saying, but the only way we're going to maintain that fellowship, not your salvation, we're going to maintain the fellowship, right? The hanging out together, the good relationship, having fellowship one with another is walking in the light. That's right. It's when we're putting the Lord before our face and we're not steering off into the darkness. When we are getting sin 
out of our life and walking in that light, that's when we have that really good fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. Notice how it all ties together. I'm not articulating it as well as I can, but the way I, my understanding is in my mind, it's hard to express, but we're seeing all of these same concepts brought forward. We saw all the same concepts in Psalm 16. And isn't it amazing how God's word is so perfect, how he could bring up these different subjects, like even Jesus Christ's soul going to hell, yet it all ties together perfectly how Psalm 16, 1 John chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, they all are talking about very similar things and concepts yeah. that work together. Amen. The fullness of our joy because Jesus Christ sacrificed for us because we're setting the Lord before our face and our trust is in Him. Everything. Right. We'll finish off this chapter, but I, just because I, I like this chapter. It's, it's really good. And these are really good to use out soul winning. If, if you ever get someone who says like they don't sit anymore, these holiness people or whatever, First John chapter 1 is a great place to take them. Uh, verse number 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So someone's trying to tell you, oh, I used to sin, but now I don't sin anymore. Yeah, the truth. Uh, okay, well, thank you for letting me know that there is no truth in you. The truth is not in you at all because First John chapter 1, verse number 8 says so. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. It is a word that's not in us. So I, I've never sinned. You're calling God a liar. We know we're sinners, but you know what? If you want to have that good joy, if you want to have good fellowship with God, walk in the light. Set him before your face. Have God at your right hand. Receive his instruction. Get the good counsel. Spend time reading God's word and receiving his counsel and, and being focused on the things of God. Don't be distracted. Don't let... You have a choice. Don't let other people distract you and, and get you away from your service to the Lord. Because you know what? It's just going to be miserable. That's right. You're going to lose joy that way. Amen. And I, I don't know. I mean, people get deceived all the time, but the people that I know that I'm thinking about by name right now in my head, I know that they don't have joy. Mm. I know that they don't. And I know that they don't, not just because the Bible says so, that's good enough. Yeah. But they don't have fellowship with God, and they don't have fellowship with the brethren. They don't have joy. That's right. Amen. They've been deceived by sin. And I pray that they'll repent and get right with God. Amen. I really do. I honestly, sincerely do. But I'm not going to be spending my time around people like that. Because right. I don't want them dragging me down. I love the joy of the Lord. And I don't want to be away from that. That's right. So let's bow our heads up a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your words and the clear teaching from Scripture. Lord, help us to not just... Um, help us to put forth the effort to study your word. To, to study it for ourselves, to know what your word says so we, we won't be deceived. Help us to, to strengthen our spirit and our soul. Help us to take the time, invest it, because it is important. And the more that we can study and learn from you, the more we should be able to strengthen ourselves and, and not be ill-affected by other people. Lord, it's not always easy, especially when we have friends that we love and I care, and I care about you know, all the people that I've been thinking. You know who I'm talking about. You know who I'm thinking about tonight, Lord. I care about every single one of them. And, um, and, I, and I hope that they do get right with you, dear Lord. But um, I don't want to sacrifice my walk with you and put you down um, in a lower position in my life than, than anybody. We love you here, dear Lord. Stand at our right hand. Continue to give us counsel. And I pray that you please bless this church and bless us all and help us to, um, to stand strong and firm in your words and the doctrine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.